we now have uh, Christian Holm. He's the manager for uh, wind turbines in, in, in Equinor. Uh, Christian uh, uh, has been working in renewables, so we're excited to hear about that now for the last 20 years. With a background from wind turbine design, assembly, testing, clarifications, etc. And he is now heading the wind turbine technology team in Equinor with responsibility of new technology turbines approvals and turbine selections. Uh, Christian has a master's degree in finance and a BSc in mechanical engineering. So let me uh, share with you now, Christian, in a second. I'll just there and thank you Arne. thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to to uh, come at, at uh, and, and meet uh, seagull and and, uh, and uh, the audience here uh, to be able to present um uh, are you seeing my screen now uh, Arne? yes we are yes we are yeah. great i'm a bit Bit new to this go to webinar interface, so so sorry for that. So um, my um, my experience is uh, in renewables. So uh, I've been watching uh, uh, the presentation this this morning. Uh, are truly impressed by by the level, um, and, and and I think uh, what I can participate with now is to kind of dumb it down a bit. Uh, go back to the kind of uh, of, uh, of of basic and 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 some of the um, and focus on some of the activities that I'm um, looking at 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 a more of a, at a daily basis. So I'm uh, heading the wind turbine technology team here at Equinor. So my team is working on our different projects in Europe, in the US, and in uh, in Asia, throughout the world, uh, and and we are advising and supporting the projects in in, in uh, decisions related to the wind turbine um, in in our projects, um, and that's uh, uh, that has a huge focus uh, because uh, it's the part that is generating uh, the energy, generating the electricity, and and uh, it it is a predominant uh, factor when it comes to uh, the economics of uh, offshore wind um, and, and uh, in our projects. So um, just start off by introducing um, there we go, uh, sustainability in Equinor. Equinor supports the Paris Agreement and a net zero future. We have already brought CO2 emissions in the oil and gas production down to industry leading levels, and we will continue to do more. Our journey to develop as a broad energy company is founded on a strong commitment to sustainability, and our strategy, always safe, high value, and low carbon, is applied in everything we do. We agree that the transition to a more sustainable energy system is taking place too slowly. A sustainable development path well below the two degree target does not allow for further delays in policy, industry and consumer, consumer action to reduce emissions. Um, we have um, a set of ambitions to reach um, by 2050, uh, which uh, says that we become a net we will become net zero by 2050 on greenhouse gas emissions. This includes what we call scope three emissions that represent the calculation of indirect emissions from customers' use of Equinor's equity production. Uh, we will continue to reduce our emissions from oil and gas, focusing on our upstream activities, um, carbon neutral global operations, um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from uh, operated offshore and onshore uh, fields and plants in Norway uh, towards near zero by 2050, and uh, ensure that we are not doing any routine flaring or near zero methane emissions by 2030. We will also continue to grow in renewable energy, expecting a production capacity of four to six 
gigawatts by 2026 and 12 to 16 gigawatts by 2035. And we will reduce our net carbon intensity to zero by 2050. We are focusing on uh, three uh, clusters. Uh, we have the US East Coast, uh, where we have several projects in the pipeline, and we have a part established a partnership there together with the DP. North Sea with the Doggy Bank uh, as the front runner, and, and the biggest offshore wind uh, project is a really interesting area for us. It covers the uh, UK. Uh, Norway uh, and, and uh, northern part of uh, Netherlands and, and Germany. And then we also have the Baltic Sea, with the, where we have a, a couple of, or three projects actually in, in, in the Baltic uh, region, uh, where, which we are currently developing. Asia is a really interesting area as well, where we have uh, we have several ongoing uh, projects and activities that we are uh, driving further. Uh, the main wind power concepts, it, this is evolution. Uh, wind has been evolving uh, dramatically over the last 40 years. Starting with onshore wind, which started the, basically their developments in uh, originally from the US, but uh, quickly Denmark took a lead on, on that, and, and this has been kind of a European uh, uh, focus area for, for, uh, for the last decades. Um, then we move out to the sea, uh, we're kind of turning the evolution uh, upside down, and we move from onshore to the sea, uh, with the, where, we are, where we are gradual gradually going uh, further out and to deeper waters. Uh, this adds to the complexity, add, this adds to the cost, but there are also several really good reasons why we are doing this. One of them is that we are in less conflict with, um, with the environment and other economical interests. Uh, interests. Uh, but perhaps the most important one is that we are uh, getting um, available more stable and higher wind conditions, and that's our, that's let's face it, that's one of the main drivers behind uh, renewables. Another item that uh, adds to the complexity is that um, this is a, a game where size really matters. Um, Wind turbines, like you see here, the example is the 13 megawatts uh, GE Halid uh, turbine that we have selected for, for our Dogger Bank project. Um, at the moment, uh, um, the biggest commercially available uh, turbine that is uh, fully certified uh, is, is a great example of that. And, and um, just to say, Something about the sizes, uh, the blade diameter is 220 meters, which gives you a rotor radius of uh, uh, about 110 meters. The weight of the blades and rotor and what we call the nacelle, which is basically the engine room on top of the turbine, is, is close to 900 tons. This um, race uh, is uh, of getting bigger, uh, stronger turbines is just continuing. Uh, we are right now in a period of, of, uh, of uh, wind development where the turbines are growing faster than ever. This is an example of a, a turbine with a 13 megawatt generator and a <clears throat> rotor diameter of 220. Vestas just recently announced uh, a new uh, turbine which will have a blade diameter of 236 meter and um, generate a size of close to 15 megawatts. So, so this dimensional, uh, dimensional race is continuing, and the, the, the game is here to capture most uh, of, the, of the wind. That's, that's the focus. Uh, this also adds to the complexity and CAPEX. Uh, the investments in the, the business is uh, skyrocketing. Although you are, we are reducing the cost of uh, levelized cost of energy, 
um, the the copex copex cost is is uh, is increasing, <clears throat> um, and in a recent report, Bloomberg New Energy Finance estimated that towards 2050, the wind turbine sizes could potentially re reach a blade diameter of 350 meters, and with a rate of the power of um, close to 30 megawatts. So, um, so with a turbine like that, the, the total weight of that turbine would, in in my guesstimate, would uh, mean that we have a turbine of close to 3,000 tons. So, so, um, so uh, it's uh, goes without saying. It's in, these are huge ins uh, installations which you need to monitor. Um, why are we focusing on, on the digital solutions? First of all, it's increasing safety. If we can remotely monitor the wind turbines that we are installing, this uh, also means that we, for instance, can visit the turbines a little, a bit less, and we are better prepared when we are visiting them. We know what we are uh, uh, are, are going to face. Um, just as an example, if we if we uh, look at the uh, doggy bank, uh, just reducing the number of visits visits annually per turbine by just one, uh, and you have three persons that joins in every visit. You have uh, for one turbine, you have one uh, transfer from a vessel to the turbine, and from the turbine back to the vessel. That means total of six transfer, the, the three crews going on the turbine and off the turbine. That's six transfers. And if you have uh, 300 turbines, like uh, we will have at Doge Bank in total, that's 1,800 crew transfers uh, in reduction annually. And that's a big win when it comes to safety. So that's really one of the most important drivers. It's also reducing costs, obviously, if we can remotely uh, uh, monitor the turbines. Uh, cost reductions are, are, uh, are a big uh, win, and it can also potentially increase revenue. Uh, by better planning, uh, you, you reduce the downtime of, of uh, each turbine. And, and this gets also more important as they grow bigger. They will, <laughs> each unit will produce more energy, and that increases the importance of making sure that they are are uh, producing. The areas of interest in a wind farm would be uh, basically what I'm saying here. I guess it's 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 all parts. Substation, the grid connection, and energy trading is is important. Uh, energy trading is uh, is another important item that. Uh, you know, uh, a wind turbine is producing when it's blowing. It's not producing uh, when it's not blowing, and there is a degree of production between those uh, those uh, areas. And, and uh, energy trading um, and 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 connect um, that the knowledge that you have from the wind farm to the market prices uh, could potentially have a huge value. Wind turbine, I'm, I'm going a bit deeper into that in the next slide. And then you also have foundation, cables, and subsurface activities. You have, um, for instance, the risk of scoring um, uh, around the, the turbine. That's something you need to monitor. Um, this is the picture of the, not the 13 megawatt G Halyard, but it's of the 6 megawatt, and it's um, basically the same layout. Um, so this just shows uh, uh, how a wind turbine looks like uh, on the on, on the inside. Um, it might 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 look look um, complicated, but it, I don't think it. You, you can simplify it. Uh, you have um, you have the rotor here with the three blades. You have the uh, pitch system, which basically pitches the blades, uh, so it either captures wind wind or don't capture wind. You have the um, uh, 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 main shaft connected to a, a large generator here, 
And on the Haleid, uh, the weight of that generator is close to 200 tons, just to say something about the dimensions. Um, and then you have the yaw system, which orients the turbine in the right direction. You're, another uh, system that is really important is the cooling system, because uh, both the generator and the um, electrical system in the turbine needs sufficient cooling to operate properly. And the areas of interest, obviously, in the in the turbine is the drive chain generator. It's big, uh, and you don't want to exchange it. Uh, the pitch system and the hub, um, all the electrical systems, and that's an interesting topic because we don't really have good algorithms to monitor uh, electrical systems. That's uh, something uh, we need uh, more research on. Blades, um, the yaw system, and auxiliaries, auxiliaries like the cooling system. But I think it's important to understand the physics in order to understand the challenges. Uh, too many systems, unfortunately, uh, from what I see, um, are just relying on pure uh, mach machine learning algorithms. But you need to combine this uh, knowledge by understanding the physics. Uh, I made a simple um, example just to uh, outline the challenges of uh, monitoring a, a wind turbine. So in this example, I'm, I'm just looking at a, a main bearing. Um, bearings are getting huge uh, as well in this, these turbines, and it's uh, uh, challenging to, um, to exchange them or, or undo repairs. So it's an area that, you, that, that is of interest. You, you want to really pay some close attention to, to the bearings. So you, uh, you start off by grabbing the data. A wind turbine consists of an abundance of, of data. A modern wind turbine has close to 9,000 data tags. Um, and you only need a, a subset of that, basically, to, to, to have a, a good monitoring system of, of, of the turbine. Um, you need uh, to have a good overview of the uh, different standards and the way the uh, OEMs are transferring data. And you need to have a good legal uh, overview of, your, of the rights to use data. And that's uh, in, in the renewables business, that's not a, <laughs> that's perhaps the biggest challenge uh, to, to actually get legal access to the data. When you got that, you need to structure the data. It, it comes like um, it, it's not a consistent uh, stream of data. It, uh, it can uh, enter your system a bit uh, randomized, so you need, to, you need to structure this properly. And then uh, you have the data storage. And uh, by listening into the presentations today, I'm, I don't need to go deeper into that. And then you have the data analytics, where you where you look into where you, where you look into the data more more closely, and then the last item if, is of course to present this and uh, uh, ensure that there are made actions if you need to do that. And and, and in this case, it's just a, a difference between estimated temperature in the bearing and and the actual temperature in the bearing. And if, if the temperature of the bearing is on the rise. Um, uh, you might need to do something. And in a bearing, the most easy thing to start with is perhaps do some uh, ex grease exchange. Uh, exchange uh, the grease. Uh, also take some grease samples to check if there are particles in the grease, uh, and, and just start to 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 look into the the problem from from that angle. Um, there has been uh, a lot of uh, talk to date on, uh, today on, on data-driven models, but I would also like to, to emphasize the need of utilizing the entire uh, tool shop that are, are available when it comes to analytics. Physics-based are, are um, often uh, the easiest and fastest way to, to achieve good results. Um, and it's also important to understand that uh, for for us working in the industry, we we are very physics oriented. We we 
we we have we have a good grasp of of the physics related to the wind turbines. So that means that physics-based uh, analytical models are often easier to understand, and that's a that I think that's a key uh, selling point for for uh, for for uh, for uh, for systems that are going to to monitor wind turbines. Uh, then you of course have the data-driven models, which is great for for large and high frequency based data. We have, we do have uh, a lot of high frequency data, vibration sensors in, in particular, uh, where, where you need data-driven models to 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 basically um, assess data from uh, on that. And between that, you have the statistical models where you are focusing on precision and uncertainty, uh, which is also an area that you shouldn't uh, underestimate. Uh, so, um, so, so I, I would li like to argue that uh, ensure that you're, when you're building a system, or when you're building a condition monitoring system or any monitoring system, use all the tools that are available because each of them are great in their own way. Um, yeah, uh, or uh, that. Uh, that was um, the presentation I prepared. I'm uh, I'm ready to take questions if you, if there are any. If perhaps you can help help me to to moderate that. I'll put my headset on. There we go. Thank you very much for the for the presentation. Uh, I see now the time is 12:06 uh, at the moment. There I. I guess this was new for the geoscientist uh, environment, Christian, but it was certainly a very interesting uh, presentation. And, and, and the way you use analytics in order to understand these things, I think we can relate that further into our uh, business as well, certainly. Um, I see that uh, uh, there's a question here on, on what kind of tools are used uh, to analyze the data. Are there particular in-house software or is it how how do you use these things um yeah at at Equinui we are um, uh, we are building our own um ecosystem of, of various uh, of various tools um a lot of these are based on our oil and gas industry for for hmm. instance you on side uh, uh, was was one of the front runners when it comes to digital solutions in in Equinoir. Uh, so we have we, also in renewables we have a lot to, to learn from that. Uh, mm. But we're not afraid of of looking outside of the industry as well. Um, uh, we uh, we are about uh, twenty thousand employees at uh, at uh, Equinoir. That means that uh, most of the smartness in the world uh, excites uh, outside of Equinoir. So now uh, it's important for us to tap into that and and um, and, and get uh, input uh, on that. So so um, at the moment, a lot of the analytical tools are, are developed in house, but we also have third party solutions that are embedded into that. Mm. Uh, there's uh, another question here also. Um, are you using any computer vision techniques on your operations? No, no, not uh, not particularly. It's it's mm. it's relatively simple. Um, mm. What we're seeing uh, seeing seeing right now, and I don't think we need at at least from what I see it now, we don't need. There is not any need for any advanced uh, solutions there uh, at the, at the moment. We we um, we, we still the, the business still needs to crawl before before we can walk and and. And uh, mm. we still have a way to to really uh, go further on the digital solutions. I guess one one time. Uh, well, we have actually a time for 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 a couple because this I think this is very very interesting. Uh, one one question is I mean there's lots of parts here, mechanical parts, and that need maintenance on on regular basis. Are you using any analytics to investigate uh, or understand when it's time to to do this maintenance uh, uh, stops, if you like. I mean, I know I was familiar with, with you listen to sound, you can uh, maybe, uh, lots of different analytics can be used in, in that sense. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that's it's a really good uh, good question, Arne. Um, I think uh, in order to fully uh, understand that this, you, you need to understand the entire chain, the different mm -hmm. sensor types that are available and, and how you can utilize them. Very often, uh, the, the, the simplest sensor type you, you can use is a, is a standard PT100. It's, it's a uh, temperature sensor. And, and, and uh, it's, it's a reliable and really cheap sensor. And you can apply it uh, around uh, any mechanical device. Uh, and, and the wind turbine is it's, it's, it's perfect. Um, and and it, it gives reliable temperature data. Uh, where where you can compare this temperature data with other uh, parameters like production, uh, ambient temperature, uh, the, the temperature inside the machine house. Um, uh, you can look at um, at uh, at different segments of the generator just by looking at the at the temperature uh, sensors. The generator. With, with permanent magnets is, is very temperature sensitive. It, it mustn't exceed around 80 degrees. Uh, or if you exceed temperatures above that, it can actually lose the magnetism. So, so uh, and that's, that will be critical. So, so there are numbers of number of things that you can monitor just by the simple temperature sensor. But we also have vibration data. Uh, where we look at, uh, at bearings, gearboxes, um, and also you can monitor blades. For instance, if you have a small damage to a blade, you can pick that up with a, a vibration sensor. Um, each time a, a blade is, is passing the, 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 the tower, uh, it has its own frequency. We, we call it the 3P effect. So each time a blade passes the, the, the tower, you, 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 you can hear the 3P effect. And a damaged blade will make a slightly different um, uh, vibration spectrum. It's things like this that, that you can you can uh, uh, dig further into. And, and mm. I think the opportunities are just tremendous. Uh, we ha just haven't uh, utilized them sufficiently yet. Mm. Thank you. It's, 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 it's very interesting. We, I think we have uh, time for one final question. So I'll, I'll share the others with you afterwards, Christian. Uh, and who, yeah. who, who, who asked them, but there's one here that want to thank you for a great talk. Can you tell us something about general optimization challenges, topics within wind farm development, for instance, selection of wind power concepts? Uh, are there any analogies to simulation-based petroleum field development in that sense that you simulate on these things? Mm. And, um, and how, how do you decide this uh, conceptual Part before you go on, if you like. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm probably the Norwegian that knows the least about oil and gas. I've been, <laughs> I've been brought up in the, I've been brought up in the renewables uh, segment, uh, and and I know that really well. But it's a strange, strange thing that I ended up at Equinor. Uh, so so uh, so I'm not, uh, perhaps not carrying the oil and gas in uh, high enough. But uh, uh, some of the, um, the challenges, first of all, wind energy is much easier offshore. The, the terrain is flat. You, you only have waves to, to that is a, is a challenge. Um, from the from an oil and gas perspective, ge geological formations is a challenge when it comes to offshore wind as well. Because um, these wind farms, they are stretching out several kilometers, even even miles. Mm -hmm. So 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 and uh, and formations, subsurface formations, are changing throughout the entire wind farm. So so that's definitely one important area where we're using our uh, expertise uh, more. Um, also, these turbines are <coughs> are interfering with each other uh, when the wind is going through a wind turbine, you extract um, some energy from the air, you get a wake effect after the wind turbine. And that can also stretch for several kilometers and, and that will affect the next turbine again. So that's mm. a type of global data analysis using uh, uh, CFD models and um, um, other 
fluid dynamics models in in order to understand uh, that how they interfere with our, each, each other. We also see wind farms, especially in Germany, US. We do expect wind farms to be packed relatively close together, and that could also uh, pose a challenge when it comes to to wind. Uh, the, 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 um, the big uh, point with, with offshore wind it's, is that the wind is relatively not tainted. You don't have any uh, mountains, trees, buildings, other objects that are, are uh, interfering with the wind. Um, so, so that has so far been one of the most important elements with why you should go offshore. Uh, we expect that to change as the uh, power density, the production density uh, in some areas will increase and wind farms will start to, uh, to inflict on, the, on other wind farms. Mm. Well, thank you very much. We, I see we now have uh, a few minutes to fill our coffee cups. Really appreciate your time for this, Christian. And, uh...